Hi everyone and welcome to another JNF Connect webinar. I hope you and your families are all well and thank you for the wonderful feedback we've been receiving in response to our previous webinars. Our team at JNF have been working hard every week to provide you with fresh and engaging content and always happy to receive your comments. Tonight is all about food and we are fortunate to have Israeli chef Ruthie Russo in conversation with Georgia Samuel. Ruthie is a world-known food expert in Israel, where she hosts her own TV show, is a guest judge on other shows, owns a cold-pressed juice company called Juso, and writes a regular food column. She also stars in a new documentary on Israeli food called In Search of Israeli Cuisine. Georgia is a founder of Famished, a popular chain of salad bars in the Melbourne CBD that she launched 10 years ago and was previously a commercial lawyer at two major Australian law firms. Ruthie and Georgia will be discussing the food scene in Israel, which has been exploding in recent years, as any visit would confirm. It's not surprising, I suppose, given the importance of meals in Jewish culture and the exciting mix of other cultures that Jews brought from the diaspora to Israel. It's also important not to forget the wonderful variety of fresh produce available in Israeli markets, such as the famous one behind me here in Machne Yehuda in Jerusalem. Much of this produce, especially during this period of closed borders, comes from desert farms in Israel's south. Literally the fruits of your partnership with JNF over many years in providing recycled water, R&D and infrastructure for communities all over the Negev and Arava. Thank you all for that partnership and ongoing support for our shared mission to continue developing Israel's periphery. I know we all look forward to the day when we can enjoy the taste of Israel again, not just remotely but on the ground. In the meantime, please enjoy tonight's session with Ruthie and Georgia. Hi everyone and welcome uh, along. Thanks for coming this evening. Um, I don't know about you, but my mouth's watering after seeing Dan's video in the background. Um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to draw your attention firstly to the chat button that is should be on the right of your screen. Uh, that's what we're going to utilise tonight just to make sure that if anyone wants to post any comments or questions, which we are going to have time for at the end of the evening, uh, just write them in that chat button, just hit that chat button and write them on, on there and we'll be um, having a look at them and as many as we can fit in at the end of the night, we'll definitely be asking Ruti about. Um, and just to let everyone know, we're also muting everybody tonight just so that we can hear our wonderful guest speaker tonight and make sure that we can hear her properly. Um, anyway, let's let's get started, I'd say. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have Ruti Russo join us this evening. Uh, Ruti has travelled all over the world as a culinary di diplomat. She's been to cities like Hanoi and Istanbul, New York and Milan, Tokyo and Beijing. Um, she's a chef and journalist, journalist, and Ruti looks at a dish and sees it all. She explains that she sees mothers and conflicts, exchange rates and GDP rankings, multinational food corporations and small farmers, health services and educational systems, all from food. And as a certified chef from the ICC in Manhattan and after many years of writing about food in Israel and abroad, Ruti has honed her skills as a culinary anthropologist enabling her to look into a kitchen and see life itself. During her travels, Wuti has participated in the most acclaimed TV shows and networks, such as CNN, NBC and ABC. She hosts the intellectual food show Lunch Break on Israel's public broad broadcast and a cooking show on Channel 12. Wuti was a lead speaker in TEDx Tel Aviv, which is, was held in Tel Aviv Cultural Hall to thousands of people. Her talk, entitled How Personal Is Your Personal Taste, is considered revolutionary and is based on her thorough research of the biological and social aspects of our taste. Wuti lives in Tel Aviv with her husband and two daughters. She plays the saxophone, enjoys birding and yoga, and she cannot stand ill. Wuti, I thought I'd uh, start by discussing a little bit about your childhood. Uh, being the daughter of Nera Musso, another culinary foodie in Israel, and absolutely famous in her own right. I imagine you were always into food and spent a lot of time in the kitchen with your mum. Is that correct? Oh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
the complete opposite, actually. My mom was considered to be the, the local Julia child. First of all, wait. I'm very happy to be here, Georgia. And um, this is a great opportunity to talk to the Jewish Australian crowd. I'm very excited about this. Uh, I hope you can hear me. That would be a good start with the Zoom and stuff. Um, yeah. So about my childhood and my mom, well, she was experimenting with all kinds of food. I mean, we didn't have any restaurants at that point in Israel. And um, I was the worst audience you can imagine. I just <laughs> didn't like to eat. I was very, very skinny. I had the worst appetite. It's not that I was a picky eater. I just didn't eat. It didn't, it didn't matter what you put in front of me. I was just not that hungry. And then um, she loved that story, my mother. Um, there was yeah. one point I came back from a friend. I was about eight, nine years old and really, really thin. And you know, Jewish mothers, they don't accept uh, no. I mean, it's like it it's like you're saying something bad about them. So Literally. I came back. <laughs> I came back from my friend's grandmother's house, and um, I told my mom, "Listen, we had this amazing lunch. We ate something there that was unbelievable." And she was oh. so excited. She finally found something that her daughter loves. So she called my friend's uh, grandmother, and she said, "What did you give her that she loves so much?" And my friend's my grandmother said mashed potatoes. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, your poor mother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, I think that yes. was the clue for her that we should um, that she should provide some simple dishes as well, not just like she brought to Israel. Aim that have she. She tried so many new ingredients that we didn't have in the 80s. But I just wanted to be a simple kid that eats mashed potatoes. I remember I was embarrassed to take out my sandwich in school because it was so complicated. Like all my friends had <laughs> just like normal palave chocolate spread. And I had meatballs and eggplants and tomato sauce. I mean, today I would die for that sandwich. Yeah, yeah now we would all eat anything. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, so I, was, uh, I was a tough audience for her. Yeah. I was not. So somehow this must have so. all, it must have all changed. How, how and when did this, did you go from being the mashed potato girl to, uh, to, to where you are today? Well, it started, I think, when I moved to New York. I mean, after my army service, which was very hectic. And very intense. I was the ADF spokesman uh, office, and uh, it was during the years in Lebanon. All my friends, my boyfriend was serving in Lebanon. A lot of, you know, many things happened. I was, I felt like overwhelmed for my army service, and I told my mom, I just want to be a waitress. I want to have a simple job that you work from for certain hours and you leave and you don't care about your work anymore. And I decided that I'm going to pursue my dream in New York. And I left, um, I left the country, it was I think 98. And it took me about, um, I worked as a three weeks, they will be. Then I started working as a personal assistant to one of America's uh, star chef, David Burke. Um, yes. And he, he had a couple of restaurants then. Um, I worked in a professional restaurant for the first time in my life. And I just loved the way it sounds. You know, when you work in a good restaurant, it has that amazing sound. I mean, it just, it's so relaxing when it works well. Like you hear people laughing, you hear um, you hear the the glasses of wines, uh, you hear people, you, you hear the forks, you hear the you hear people enjoying, and it just I love that sound, and yeah. um, that got me into food, and I just started my own journey at that point, and yeah, 
that, yeah, I completely understand. There's something special about, um, you know, seeing people enjoying food, whether it's, you know, your grandmother's cooking or, as you say, in a fine dining restaurant, there's something very right. special about it. Yeah. Um, so would you say there's, there's such a thing as Israeli food? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I hear that a lot. I claim that there is, but uh, I argue mostly with locals that claim that there isn't. Um, the a moment of realization. I was traveling in south of France for about 10 days and I was well pampered. I mean, I was taken to like really good restaurants and uh, markets and little joints and everything perfect and everything was delicious. But at some point, I remember myself sitting down um, in a cafe that was also like really nice and uh, the food was great. And just thinking that what I would do to have a little bit of tahini, some chili pepper, maybe preserved lemon with me, <laughs> a little bit of uh, chopped parsley, and I'll be perfect. I just need my stuff here. And that was the yes, point where I realized that there is such thing as Israeli food. You just, there's stuff you need to combine together. It's about, Israeli food, obviously, it's not about the roots. I mean, you see, like uh, Palestinian food, like the food uh, that was grown here uh, based on the uh, local product. It is very, it is very profound. It has uh, um, a local history. Israeli food is not like that. And it has its uh, pros and cons. I mean, there are so many millions of immigrants coming here trying to, you know, trying to make their mother's food, their grandmother's food, and uh, they don't have the ingredients, they don't have the weather, they don't have the, the stuff, like the, even just the ambience to, to make the food from uh, Western Europe, from all, you know, North Africa. We don't have that stuff here. So you have to compensate and you have to uh, make adjustments. And you just create new encounters that, that for me is Israeli food. I mean, it's those new yeah. encounters and they're always great. They're always fresh. They're very innovative. They have their chutzpah. They have yeah. their charm. <laughs> they're very passionate. Like everybody today, is you know, food shows who you are. So our food yeah. shows who we are. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think we're all just hoping we can be there sometime soon to experience it. Um, so I guess uh, what I wanted to ask you about was how you actually be became introduced to food ambassadoring, like where have you been, you know, things like that. I, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. So, like, uh, what, I, I think we've got a few uh, internet issues, but we're, we're trying our best here, obviously. Um, what, how were you introduced to food ambassadoring? So, um, where have oh, you been, you know, okay. reactions to Israeli food, maybe a story you remember okay. from your travels, things like that. Okay, so I worked as a food journalist. I mean, I, when I was in New York working for Chef David Burke, I decided that I want to, to, to be a professional, a professional chef, at least a certified one. I didn't, think for, I didn't think I'm going to be a chef in a restaurant, but I knew I'm going to work in the food industry and I wanted to have the, the right knowledge. So I went to the ICC, then it was called the FCI in Soho in uh, New York, the French Culinary Institute. I finished the, the, um, uh, the complete program to be a certified chef. Um, and then I came back to Israel. When I, finished my, uh, when I finished school, I came back to Israel and everyone was expecting me to do what my mom is doing. She's a food journalist for many years. And I said, well, I'm not going to do what she's doing because she's really good at what she's doing and <laughs> I'm not going to do what she's doing. But, you know, destiny has its own ways and um, it chases you and it finds you. <laughs> and mothers have I their was, own ways. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> I was writing in the newspaper about uh, news related topics. Uh, when I came back to Israel, I was working as an, as, just as a journalist. And uh, my editor kept asking me if I want to write some, something about food. And I said, no, I'm not going to do what my mom is doing. And then I had my first child. 
and working as a journalist became very tough. You know, you wake up in the morning, you don't know what your day is going to be like. And they asked me again if I want to write about food. And I said, okay. And I remember my first column, it was uh, Rosh Hashanah, uh, 2007. And um, it felt like coming home, (laughs) writing about food. You know, it's my mother's tongue. So today, first of all, I'm not doing what she's doing. I'm not only doing what she's doing, I'm doing it with her. We write together a food column for you, Diyot Akhono. But along my journey as a food journalist, I explored um, the new Israeli kitchen. I looked at it as a new language. And I wrote several pieces about the new Israeli kitchen. And at some point, to uh, different countries. And since I'm a certified chef and not just a food journalist, I was able to show the food as well, not just to talk about it. Um, So I started traveling and the more I traveled, I traveled more. And um, I was in the Far East many times, like Hanoi, Beijing, uh, Manila, Tokyo, um, uh, uh, Seoul, I think everywhere in the Far East, I've been everywhere sometimes several times and um, I was surprised to see how excited everyone was about uh, Israeli kitchen Um, they were really excited to try it I I felt like it was they came from home wanting to like this kitchen they wanted to to respect it and it meant a lot for me um, doing what I do Uh, the, the photo we see now, that's actually a really funny story. I was in Beijing um, doing, making an Israeli, an Isra- typical Israeli Friday dinner. And I had to incorporate all kinds of kitchens in that story, all kinds of, um, um, how do you say, all kinds of... Um, Cuisine. Um, you know, from... From um, uh, from South uh, from uh, North Africa from Eastern Europe, I try to to bring all the kitchens I I different like cuisines. When I, exactly, yeah. but from from uh, my Jewish background. Um, yeah. So and at some point, I'm not sure if you can see in the back there. There's the brick oven that they never use. Yeah. It's uh, the Crown Plaza in Beijing. It's a huge kitchen, huge. It's five floors. The hotel is the biggest one I've seen in my life. And um, they're overstaffed, obviously. They had, like, they gave me 20, 20 Chinese cooks to work with me, but none of them spoke English. So that was a <laughs> bit of a problem. So yeah. I saw this brick oven and I said, let's use it. I mean, it was never, they never used it before, before I came there. They never used the brick oven, but it was just there for decoration. I said, I'm going to use it. I'm going to make fresh pizza bread. You're going to love it. They didn't know what it was. So I said, I'm just, I'm going to make pizza bread. What I need for pizza bread, the most simple ingredients. I just need uh, yeast, water, and flour, and that's it. And they look at me and they're like, I have 20 people in front of me, and they're like, flour? I'm like, yes, flour, you know, I need to make pizza bread. I need to make dough, just to make dough. And I'm trying to show with my hands, but, you know, they just don't work with the same logic that I do. I mean, I I try to make the sound of flour, and I'm like, or I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to, to look like I'm kneading a dough. And they all look at me and they're like, flour? Flour? They don't know what I'm talking about. No. So for like 12 minutes, 15 minutes go by, and I'm really frustrated. Because that's like, I thought that would be the most simple dish to make. And at some point, one cook says, oh, flour. And he runs. And he comes back after like five minutes with a bouquet of roses. And oh my like, flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the flower you're after. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah, that's going to be a unique kind of pizza bread. <laughs> yes, absolutely. A pretty one. <laughs> but, but you can see I ended up making that pizza and everyone loved it. And it was a great success at the end. Brilliant.
So can you tell us um, a little bit, obviously right now we're in a particularly unusual time being in lockdown. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your cooking experience during lockdown and during this COVID period? I assume it, it, prob it probably will be a little similar. I mean, when we started this whole thing, everyone started, uh, you know, uh, saving food. <laughs> We thought we we're going to starve at home. So people <laughs> bought tons of flour and eggs. We ran out of eggs in Israel. I'm not sure what the situation there. Flour, yeah, eggs, and, to and toilet paper. I'm like, what are you going to make? <laughs> <laughs> Same here. <laughs> so I think it was a nice experience because you, you saw so many people starting to cook. There were no restaurants. You could do takeaway, uh, but people were a little bit worried about the takeaway at the beginning and a little bit worried about the financial situation. So, and they had a lot of time. So they started cooking and um, they started texting me in all kinds of mediums. I mean, in, on Instagram, on Twitter, on WhatsApp, wherever they could find me, they would text me, what should I do with uh, if I have uh, a chicken and some parsley? What should I do if I have this and this? And I started instructing people all the time about like what they can make and um, and posting stuff like posting like really really simple recipes on Instagram and publishing them on the newspaper. But on the I usually write for the weekend magazine. But during the Corona season, I <laughs> wrote uh, I wrote a daily a daily recipe and everyone would make it like people i would get dozens of photos of people making that recipe every day like a new recipe um there oh, was yeah. one recipe there was one recipe uh, that i actually posted uh, years ago probably two or three years ago and when the corona started here when the lockdown started one of uh, israeli's uh, news anchor decided she's going to try and make it. It's a roasted cabbage recipe. Um, you just take a, a cabbage, 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 and you just put, you, you slice it, but not till the end. You just make uh, like an X in the middle, in the center, and you stuff it with herbs and lemons and, uh, oh yeah, you can see it now, with herbs and lemon. I, I like to add chili pepper, some salt, maybe some uh, sage, and you wrap it up with a foil and put it in the oven, the highest temperature uh, for four hours. I know it sounds crazy, but it comes out amazing. Okay, it's just like, it gets like this shell on the outside and it's like, it melts in the inside and it's delicious. It tastes like, it's just, it's delicious. So Yum. This, uh, Do you put it like on pita or something or literally eat it out of the cabbage? <laughs> You eat it out of the cabbage with a little bit of tahini sauce. You can, or I mean, or with nothing. I mean, it's just it's really good as it is. Uh, but you don't you eat it out of the cabbage. Yeah, you just scoop it and put it in your plate. So yeah. this news anchor, she tried it and she took a photo when it came out, and she's like, "What is it, Lucy? What is it?" She didn't try. It. I mean, she made it, but she didn't taste it. I'm like, "Don't worry. This is what it should look like. Just taste it." And her next tweet, it was, everything was on Twitter. And the, her next tweet was, uh, oh my God, it's one of the best things I've had in my life. And <laughs> that made history. I mean, hundreds, I, I might say even thousands of people made this cabbage during the Corona time. I mean, during the lockdown, <laughs> everyone bought red cabbage and made it because it's so simple to make. I would yeah. get like, I would get, 40, 50 photos of cabbage every day of people making it and trying it. And I'll give you the recipe at the end. Yeah, I was about to say, just in case anyone's concerned, we are posting all the recipes that Wilti is generously giving us um, on Facebook tomorrow. So you don't need to worry about taking notes. <laughs> and she's going to be giving us some good ones. That is a, certainly a good one. I can't imagine roasting a cabbage in an oven for four hours. Four hours, um, yep. Yeah, amazing. Um, so obviously many people have taken up cooking during ISO because um, they haven't had much else to do and a lot of people I think have been cooking with their kids as well. What's the best advice you can give to someone who's started cooking for the first time? Um, I would I would say I think 
uh, over evaluate the flavor. <laughs> you know, it's not a popular thing to say, but I think if your heart and mind is in it, then that's the most important thing about your food. I have this, um, I'll tell you a story that happened a couple of years ago. Um, my, my daughter was in kindergarten and uh, in Israel, we have this thing in all the kindergartens do that. Every Friday, they make, uh, they make challah with the kids. Yeah, and when they you have come to do that pick up, you, you do that, you have that too? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you, we come to pick up the kids and they bring a little challah with them and we take them home. And usually the parents eat it on the way back. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> my, my daughter's teacher, she made the worst challah you can imagine. It was so bad. It, it had like chunks in it. It was really sweet. It was part too wet, part too dry. Really bad. And it's a pretty I really hope she's not watching. Oh, she knows. Don't worry. She knows. Okay. I, I, would, I would come to her and say, how come you make such horrible challahs week after week? And she would say, you know, I stay here with your daughter, so you should be careful. Um, <laughs> True. <laughs> so there was one Friday, I dropped my, my daughter in kindergarten, and um, I noticed there were no parents around. So I asked her teacher, can you show me the dough? I just want to understand what you're doing wrong. Just show me the dough. And she took me to the kitchen, and she showed me the dough, and it looked pretty much like the challah. You could see... She underneath the dough, it had chunks in it. it. And I asked her, what's the recipe you follow? She said, I don't follow any recipe. I just add the ingredients and, uh, and I mix it. And I said, well, you have to follow a recipe. And I started kneading the dough and I said, look, when you knead it, it would develop the gluten. It would become very soft. It would become velvety in your hands. And uh, I, I explained everything as if I was a uh, doctor spoke of uh, <laughs> uh, the, of the world. My daughter was hanging around and she was so proud. And she's like, my mother is a chef. She can cook everything. Everything she makes is delicious. And I just didn't want to mention that last dinner, she didn't eat, she didn't eat anything. And she said she doesn't like anything. She doesn't like hummus, you know. But now she was just proud of her mom being this great chef who makes the best challah. And I was very um, arrogant, you know. <laughs> and the dough looked beautiful at the end. It was shiny, it was soft. It just looked like the perfect challah dough. And I Brilliant. told uh, the teacher, and I told the, te the teacher, well, you have to leave it in a warm place, covered, and then it, it, you have to, um, to let it rise. And um, I couldn't wait for a quarter to one to pick my girls up and to see the beautiful challah um, that I made. And on the way to kindergarten, I could see the parents uh, walking with something that looked like a, a giant cracker, I think. Maybe more like a matzah than a challah. <laughs> and, um, and the teacher was waiting for me at the entrance and she's like, I can't believe you have the guts to show your face here. Well, oh. the challah didn't work. It didn't come out very nice. It came out the worst she ever made was the one that I made. Oh. And um, I just, I think that point, I realized that when you walk into a kitchen and you stop making food, you can be arrogant and you can think too high of yourself. You have to put everything out and just think about the people you're cooking for and that will make everything great. I mean, just think about the people you love, how much you want to feed them. You want them to be nourished. And I think that's the most important rule in the kitchen and it's never in a recipe. When you write down a recipe, no one puts in, just be attentive. Think about the people you love. Don't bring your anger, don't bring your a pride into the kitchen. Just Very be true. committed to what you do. And I think that's the most important rule when you start cooking. Excellent. Um, now, Shavuot is coming up. Can you, can well, you tell I us a little bit bring... about... No? 
Sorry, we are definitely okay, I hear technical. enough. I hear enough. Yeah, you got me. Um, Shavuot is coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about Shavuot in Israel? Well, it, it's uh, at this point, Shavuot is like the dairy holiday. Um, all the dairy farms, we have some big ones and smaller ones. Uh, that's their celebration. Um, this is the night where all the families meet and don't eat meat. <laughs> Israelis, you know, they love meat usually most of the time, uh, but that's, uh, that's the only holiday where you meet and enjoy the dairy products of the country. And we have some great cheese here. I mean, it's usually not high fat. Uh, um, but I think it's great. I mean, I love to incorporate it into the Israeli food because it fits it perfectly. And um, and everyone is uh, looking for a cheesecake, <laughs> for a cheesecake yeah. recipe at the end. And hopefully to all be together over Shavuot. I assume some of your restrictions have lifted a little bit over there and like ours and you actually be able to share it. Yes. yes. Fantastic. I know we certainly all are here. It's going to be the first time that we can all hopefully some of us be together. Um, what, what would you say the personal like personal significance of Shavuot is to to you? Do you do you have a personal significance for it? Mm, you know, in Israel, in Israel, for in the Jewish culture, there's the thing Tikkun Shavuot because Shavuot is the Chag Matan Torah when we got the Bible. Uh, well, yeah. I'm not religious, but um, I love that phrase, Tikkun Shavuot, because when you, when you look at it literally, I know that's not the meaning, but Tikkun in Hebrew is like fixing, okay? That's um, correcting or fixing, Tikkun Shavuot. And, um, and I think it's, um, it's a good time for self-reflection or self-observation. Um, especially I look at it in a culinary uh, point of view. Um, a couple of years ago, I was right. I wrote a piece for the newspaper about my personal Tikkun Shavuot, and it was about a, a restaurant critic, an Israeli restaurant critic, very known, who wrote a, a piece about a new restaurant and completely bashed that restaurant. And they just opened. It was they they were not even open. I mean, almost open. And he was visiting, and he wrote something horrible and he's a great writer and he made it like funny but in a vicious way and and i thought about the person on the other side you know who put his life into that place and who has a wife and kids at home and that humiliates his his life journey his uh everything with just to 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 get some rating um mm -hmm. And, and it hurt me, it hurt me to read that because you know, as a chef yourself, as someone who creates food, you know, when you serve someone, when you serve a dish, you serve yourself, you're there, you're, you're almost, you feel like you're naked. And if someone tells you bad things about it, it's like, it, it, it's so painful. And I yeah. think people don't really understand how painful that can be, especially now yeah. with all the reality shows and, um, with the food reality shows people are like praising food criticism it's like if you can look at the dish and say oh this is ridiculous this is stupid this is not good this is then then you're good then yeah. you get raising then people admire you and um and i think for me shavuot is a time to to appreciate if someone made food for me and it doesn't yeah. matter even if it's in a restaurant or if it's uh, if it's at home, just the fact that someone took the time and made the food, it's like don't be so critical. Yeah. Try to try to um, to appreciate the moment. Try to, to appreciate the fact that you do have food. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'll just quickly ask you. I believe you've got a new recipe book coming out. When will it be released in English? Um, my book was actually uh, published uh, a couple of months ago. Um, it's my first cookbook. I've worked on it for 
about 10 years. It was not easy. It's a collection of, um, of my personal journey of very simple uh, down to Um, very basic, uh, with lots of explanations. I actually got it translated, but the translation was not good, and uh, I didn't like it. And I yeah. said we have to get it retranslated. I mean, I can yeah. I can tell when my English is not good enough to fix it, but it's good enough to understand that it's not good. That no, just, uh, <laughs> took all especially if you're following a recipe. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it was just not good. I was not satisfied yeah, with it. So hopefully um, my publisher may, maybe will do like a, like a head start to get it um, to get it um, translated again and published. Fantastic. So we can't wait. We can't wait to get it ourselves. Um, now I know that everyone's very excited to that because you're you're happy to share some recipes with us. Um, I guess it's now time for you to start showing us what you're made of. <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to it. So, and I guess go go ahead and let us know what you're going to make and start cooking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wanted to make something simple and Israeli, and um, that you can follow at home just by buying some ingredients. I sent you the recipe so everyone can make it uh, and make all the ingredients uh, beforehand. Um, yeah. We're going to stuff pita bread with some stuff. Um, I just remember when I was in Beijing and made that pita bread uh, with the roses, then <laughs> I made, I have to tell you just this short story. I made this Friday dinner and we had on the, on the same table, we had um, um, you know, um, Moroccan fish dish with, the, yeah. with tomato sauce and tahini. And we also had yes. simis, you know, like glazed, um, glazed carrots right. for my Chinese audience. That didn't matter that this is North African and this is Eastern European. They put everything with the tabule in oh. it, everything on pizza. So I think that put everything in a pizza, <laughs> at least not for me. I mean, I would rather put the right stuff in my pizza. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a pita that fits Shavuot. I have a fresh pita here. I'm just going to put a, a top shot now so people can follow what I do. You won't see me, but you can hear me at the same time. Yeah. And just a reminder to everyone, the recipe will be, will be on Facebook. So don't worry about knowing right. everything down. So I have this fresh Israeli pita, which is great. And I've made before, I've made some uh, stuff here. I made uh, roasted cauliflower. And I gave you the recipe. It's very easy to make. You just, uh, you cook it in water first and then you put it in the oven until it gets that golden, beautiful color with a little bit of olive oil. And this is probably my favorite thing in the kitchen. These are uh, roasted cherry tomatoes with the uh, roasted chili pepper that I love. I mean, I can put that in everything that I do. I mean, every sandwich, everything that I make, oh, I would rather have that instead of anything else. So I have my pita bread. I'm just going to chop a little bit of parsley. And I'm just going to have a little bit of fresh parsley. Besides, I'll put a little bit of red onion. And I'm just going to add some garlic. Some garlic and some lemon, some fresh garlic and some lemon zest. And we'll put, I mean, I call it uh, creme fraiche, but it's not really creme fraiche because you can't get uh, creme fraiche in Israel. Um, I use very high fat sour cream, which is the best substitute I find for creme fraiche. 
So we'll make pizza bread with creme fraiche, with uh, roasted cherry tomatoes, with roasted chili, a little bit of ca- a little bit of uh, roasted cauliflower, fresh parsley, fresh um, fresh red onion, and some uh, some uh, lemon zest with some lemon zest with the uh, garlic. So that is going to be our sauce. So now put some sour cream in my pizza. I'll try to keep it open. So this is going to be a vegetarian pizza. It's not going to be vegan, but vegan, but it's going to be excellent for Shavuot. I'll take a little bit of my cauliflower. and just add it in. I know it sounds weird, but it works perfect with the cauliflower. And if you do want to make it vegan, you can substitute the uh, creme fraiche or the sour cream with the, um, you can substitute the, the sour cream with tahini. And I'm going to add some tomatoes, roasted tomatoes. You can see it right here. Mm, tomatoes are amazing. <laughs> I think you're making everyone hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> this is just lunchtime here. And yeah, I, will we'll add like bit, yeah. <laughs> I will add a little bit of parsley and some red onion. Yum. I will put a little bit of my um, lemon zest and garlic sauce on top. Can you see that? That, that looks really so bad. Oh, that looks <laughs> I, I'm so just going to add a little bit of salt. And I think I'm done. That's that amazing. looks amazing. <laughs> Do you roast the cauliflower in the same oven as the um, tomatoes and chili pepper? Yeah, yes. I just turn it on grill, high temperature, and and it comes out perfect, yes. You just have to, awesome. when you make roasted vegetables, I think the most important thing is don't be afraid to burn them. You don't want to have wet, sweating vegetables. You want them to be roasted. You want them to have like caramel. You have them to get concentrated, to get like the most flavor yeah. out of them. So yeah. yeah, you can make it in a, a, any regular oven. That would be perfect. Okay. All right, excellent. And you were going to do some more demos, I believe. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You said you're, you're happy to do more, so a couple of more recipe demos, demonstrations? Um, if you want, I can show you how to make pita bread on the oven. You want to try that? Yes? Let's go for okay, it. Let's yeah, give it absolutely. a try. Let's give it a try. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I, I've, made, uh, I've made some uh, pita dough. It is really, really basic yeast dough, very simple to make. Um, I'll give you the recipe as well for the yeast dough if you want that. Um, yes. Usually you would make it in a brick oven, in a very, very hot oven to get that beautiful pocket, uh, that beautiful yes. pocket in a pizza, which for me is always the magic to see that the pizza puffs and, uh, um, and the, you can, it's just the magic. But I've just learned during the lockdown that you can make it on a regular nonstick um, pan. Um, yeah. What you need to do is once you have the once you have the the yeast dough ready, you roll it you roll it into um, about from one kilo. I make about fifteen pitas, so you roll it into fifteen bowls, and then you have to stretch them and knead them and roll them into pita shape like this. Can you see that? Yeah. We've just, I think we've lost your sound, Wuti. I'm not sure if it's me or everyone.
Yeah, well, T, we can't hear you. I don't know if you've accidentally hit mute or um, if it's your earphones, but we can't actually hear your audio anymore. No, we've lost your audio. I wonder if, um, if it's to do with your earphones. You can take the earphones out, maybe. Yeah, we've lost her. She's coming back. Apologies, guys. This is the reality of doing something like this during COVID-19. Can you hear me now? Yes, we're back. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so we'll go back to my pizza making. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Okay, we're going to wait just a second here for the pen to heat. This is your magic, you're saying. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes it doesn't work, like all magic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> all magic. Be patient. It takes patience. Magic takes patience. <laughs> Absolutely does. Meanwhile, do we have any questions? Maybe I can. Do I do. I've got. Well, yeah, we'll take a question while we're waiting for that. I've got a um, a question from Ilana in Melbourne, and her question is: Ruti, what does your mother think of your cooking? Um. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, she likes it and she respects what I do. But I think I have a lot of uh, like local influences, which means I cook. Uh, I like to make spicy food, and I like to use garlic. And she doesn't like that. She's uh, you know she's Polish, um, <laughs> and yeah. when she eats like this garlicky spicy food, it's like it, it overwhelms her. So I mean, she likes my food, but there's we have some arguments. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I'll just have a look at the chat. Is anyone wanting to, um, you know, post some more questions? We don't have many at the moment, but I think there's a few possibly coming in. Um, how's your pan looking, Ruti? Uh, do you um, cover the cauliflower with oil before roasting? Yes, I brush it. I, I brush I brush it with um, with oil. I cook it first. Yeah. I cook it in water, and yeah. um, um, with salted water. And that's the way to season the cauliflower. You don't want to just sprinkle yeah. salt on top. You want to get the salt inside. So you cook it for about eight minutes in salted water, and at the end you put it in the oven. You have to keep keep the leaves if it's possible. Keep the leaves because they are the most delicious part in the cauliflower. Put it in the oven, yeah. brush it with olive oil, um, use the grill function and top highest temperature you have. Depends on your oven, but that would take about between 10 to 20 minutes until it gets uh, golden brown with burnt marks, with apparent burnt marks on the cauliflower, and that means it's done. Yeah. Wait, can see, and then, let's see the pizza here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now it's the time that I'm praying. <laughs> we'll see if it comes up. Please, please come up. We'll trust you even if it doesn't, Lutu. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> while, that, while that's trying to do its magic, I'll ask you a couple of other questions. Uh, you mentioned before yeah. the boiling of the cauliflower before you roast it. Someone has asked, um, they said that they, they roast their cauliflower without cooking it first and it's delicious. Why do you recommend boiling it? I, I know you just said about putting the salt, getting the salt flavor through. Right, the cauliflower. that's one of the reasons, but I like the cauliflower to be really, really soft. I mean, yeah. I like it to be a little crispy on the outside, but very, very soft in the inside. It's like the the red cabbage. I mean, it gets like it's it, it melts after the yeah. the first uh, cooking, and then the roasting, you get that melting cauliflower feeling, and it's delicious that way. Yeah. Let me know if you're ready or you're going to wait. How are we going? <laughs> I don't think we got the pocket. <laughs> That's okay. We trust it happened. I mean, it's still looks delicious to me. Delicious, but I don't think we can fit it up. I'll see when it gets a little colder. Okay. Um, we've got another question, which is a great one. Why is the food scene in Israel so vibrant? Like, what's made it flourish, do you think? Um, I think that the answer <laughs> is not what you would expect it to be, because I think there's a correlation between, um, between politics and uh, international relationships and culinary. Um, I think we are, when you are respected uh, in the international arena, then people yeah. are they would want to try your food and like it. They would want yeah. to like it. It's not just that they would want to try it. Um, yeah. So I, I, I mean, I think Israeli food, obviously it's great timing in terms of uh, middle uh, Mediterranean diet and it's healthy and it's fresh and it's vibrant and it has lots of vegetables and olive oil and low fat cheese and everything. But the fact that it is um, so well accepted around the world these days, I think it has nothing to do with the flavors. I think it has more uh, with the fact that Israel apparently is being uh, respected internationally for yeah. many reasons. I mean, it can be for what the country has achieved in a very short time. It can be for it's a uh, high tech uh, dominance. It can be for other re for many reasons. But the fact is yeah. that people want to like it, yeah. and that helps. Okay, I've got heaps more questions coming in here now, so I'll, I'll give you a few more um, if you're willing to give the time. How much influence does uh, Arabic? Do you think Arabic food has on Israeli food? Oh, a lot of influence. A lot of influence. Yeah. I mean, we have to. It, First of all, that's the geography. I mean, we're surrounded by uh, Arab countries and uh, they know and they knew how to cook the local food better than all the immigrants who came here knew it. So the, the local produce, how to use the, how to, to do the local agriculture. We had to, like the, the, the immigrants had to learn from someone and there was yeah. a very, um, beautiful history of local agriculture, of the heirloom agriculture in this land. And um, yes, I think it has a lot of influence, but it works vice versa. Like if you go to an Arabic restaurant these days, you see potato salad, you see the influence of like the immigrants uh, on yeah. the Arabic, uh, on the Arabic kitchen, the local Arabic kitchen. Yeah, great. Um, and I've got another one here. Does your family appreciate your talent? I better. Of course, yes. I think that, yes. the, but the most. Oh, you're not going to do to eat mashed potato. Oh, you're talking about my girls, my daughters. Oh. Your own family, yeah. Okay, that family. I mean, yes, they, they, I think they like it that their mother is well known. Uh, but yeah. in terms of food, they give me a hard time like every other kid. Don't worry. I mean, my, my daughter can come back from school and she would say what there is to eat. And I would say, OK, we have a roasted cauliflower and roasted vegetables and tahini and pita and uh, majadra and all the stuff that I made. And she would be like, um, there is anything else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, OK, I'll just yeah. grab an apple. 
you know, it's just, yeah. kids, they just want the attention. She doesn't want food that is already made. She wants me to go out of my hand and make something specifically for her. And it doesn't matter what it is. It can be, you know, a pizza with a slice of cheese and tomato sauce. Like, <laughs> as long as I make it just for her. Absolutely. All right, I think we've got time just for one more question. Um, other than Israeli food, is there any, is there any other cuisine that you really like? Um, I think I really like... Um, I really like Turkish food. I'm half Turkish. That's the food of uh, my half of my family. I enjoyed very much uh, Japanese and Vietnamese food. And um, I have, of course, Italian food I mean, is probably one of my favorites. But I have a very, I mean, but those are, those are the, the cliches. Like to say Italian, Japanese, uh, even Turkish food are the cliches. But I think... One of my favorite food uh, cuisines is the Ethiopian kitchen. Um, I'm very into <laughs> Ethiopian food. Uh, it got me to travel to Ethiopia at some point and to start my own research, go back to university, which I'm doing at this point, to learn, the, um, to study it about the ways we accept or don't accept um, Ethiopians and other African kitchens uh, based on international relationship, relationship, our history, colonialism, all this stuff that affects us when we think we make our own decisions. That's my, uh, my TED talk. When we think we make our own personal decisions, we're actually influenced by greater, greater powers. Um, so yeah. every, all this journey... Uh, all this journey started from studying about uh, Ethiopian food, which I love. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we are coming up to 60 minutes, and um, I know that other people may, you know, may not have the time to, to continue on as much as we'd love to, because I've certainly enjoyed listening to every, every bit of insight that you've provided, and I've loved watching you cook. I, I think I might be making that pita for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> um, you've been an absolute inspira inspiration to listen to. Um, I do apologise to everybody for some of the tech issues. I hope you did catch most of it because it really was insightful, but I do believe that it will be on, uh, it'll be replayed on YouTube if you do want to watch it again tomorrow, I think. Uh, JNF, in any event, will be uh, sending you an email with the details to access it uh, and also to uh, with all the recipes. So I've just been informed that they're not just going to be on Facebook, but the whole database will actually receive an email with all the recipes written out thoroughly. So that will give you the answers to whether you put the oil and spices, uh, where you put them and, and how you do it <laughs> uh, in more detail. Thank you so much, Ruti, for Wait, all your time. Wait, just one thing before we step. Yes. That's my pita. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Yum. And, uh, it would be easier home. after the lockdown is over. If I just come and do a workshop person to person in front of you, that would make it that more simple for sure. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> so, Thank you so day, much. happy holiday. Happy Shavuot. Happy, uh, happy Shavuot. And thank you for everyone for attending. And, thank uh, you, everyone. Jennifer. Hopes to see you at the next JNF Connect webinar. Thank you.